Um, our ha Hazlitt Memorial Lecturer this afternoon is Martin Fridson. Uh, Martin is perhaps the most well-known figure in the high-yield world, according to Investment Dealers Digest. Over 25 years span with brokerage firms including Salomon Brothers, Morgan Stanley, and Merrill Lynch, he became known for his innovative work in credit analysis and investment strategy. Fridson received his B.A. cum laude in history from Harvard College, and his MBA from Harvard Business School. He has served as president of the Fixed Income Analysis Society, governor of the Association for Investment Management and Research, now the CFA Institute, and director of the New York Society of Security Analysis. In 2000, the Green Magazine called Fridson's financial statement analysis, quote, one of the most useful investment books ever. The Financial Management Association International named Fridson the Financial Executive of the Year in 2002. In 2000, he became the youngest person ever inducted into the Fixed Income an Analyst Society Hall of Fame. The Boston Globe said his 2006 book, Unwarranted Intrusions, The Case Against Government Intervention in the Marketplace, and there are many copies all over the Institute here, should be listed for best business book of the decade. Now, I read this book, and it, it was what stimulated me to, to invite um, uh, Martin here. Um, and I, I, I tell you, uh, as a professional economist, it, it really has more economic insight and sense than all the articles that were published in 2006 in the American Economic Review. <laughs> um, so I, I am very pleased to have just met and, and now to present to you um, Morton Fridson. Lou, thank you for very, very kind uh, comments. And um, I wanted to just say, first of all, that it, it is really a pleasure to be here in the loveliest village on the plains. And uh, it's truly an honor to be speaking at the Mises Institute. I, I had another honor this week uh, in the form of making page one of the New York Times. Uh, unfortunately, the edge was taken off that one a little bit because Governor Elliot Spitzer made page <laughs> one the same day. Um, uh, his article, by the way, had nothing to do with the state of the leverage buyout industry. Um, but uh, unlike mine, his article was above the fold. So uh, uh, all in all, speaking to this gathering is definitely the biggest honor of the week and, uh, in fact, of the year for me. So um, Now, in addition to expressing my thanks for this invitation, I also want to acknowledge a debt to the Mises Institute. Um, uh, is it? I think you have a copy of what I'd like to uh, speak about. But the, the debt um, is that my book on unwarranted intrusions uh, has a chapter on America's misguided policy of criminalizing payola. And uh, the uh, basic idea of that is that if you go into a supermarket, uh, every inch of the shelf space has been paid for by a food manufacturer or you know, uh, some other uh, consumer goods company. Now, the only way you can possibly get people to buy recorded music is for them to hear it. Uh, that has been proven over many, many decades, and it, yet if you pay to enable them to hear your music, uh, you'll get prosecuted, possibly by Elliot Spitzer. I mean, he, he, uh, he had mentioned in the book that he uh, took up such a case. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, like real estate, radio airtime has a value. So if you make it illegal for a market to exist for this asset, all you're going to achieve is to create a black market for that asset. And this has been repeated uh, over many, many years. In fact, uh, Paola, uh, people have the idea that uh, this was something that started around the time that Murray Rothbard uh, wrote The Problem of Paola uh, in 1956. It actually had been going on for uh, uh, many decades before that, even before the era of, of recording, uh, there was Paola because they, that's how they sold sheet music as well. Uh, by getting famous artists to uh, uh, perform the music. Uh, Murray Rothbard, you see here, and I know his, uh, his books are well represented out here in, uh, in the hallway and was vice president of the Institute. Uh, but this article that he wrote about Paola in 1956 was not published until uh, 2001 when it appeared in the uh, Institute's publication, Free Market. 
and it was extremely helpful in putting together that chapter. So uh, uh, I'm very grateful. By the way, um, uh, Rothbard in this article indirectly anticipated the introduction of satellite-based subscription radio several decades later. Uh, and if you'll indulge me a small digression, I have to mention a wonderful story about Murray Rothbard and a circle of his anarchist-minded friends who enjoyed uh, composing songs, uh, playing board games, and going to movies together. One movie they went to was a horror picture about a man-eating tree. Rothbard cheered for the tree the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, he said, the people he ate were aggressors. They kept trying to set the tree on fire or chop it down. <laughs> when the tree hadn't done a damn thing to them. <laughs> uh, so uh, three key themes run through un unwarranted intrusions. Uh, theme one is the stark contrast between bedrock economic principles, which were accepted by economists clear across the ideological spectrum on the one hand, and political rhetoric on the other hand. An example is a survey of the early 1990s found that 93% of economists agreed with the statement that the usual effect of import tariffs and quotas is to reduce economic welfare. Yet Congress engages in idiocies such as overriding the Linnaean system to declare that catfish native to Vietnam are not really catfish, and, and they cannot be marketed in the United States uh, as such. This is a purely protectionist piece of legislation and just one of many uh, ludicrous examples. Um, you know, I, I live in New York City, and another of the findings of that survey was that a similar proportion of economists agreed that rent control uh, reduces the stock and quality of housing, I was reluctant to include it in the book because it's such a standard example given in elementary economics textbooks, uh, and yet I, I was uh, uh, fascinated by the fact that we had a um, mayoral election uh, right around the time the book was coming out, and there were uh, five major candidates on the Democratic side, one representing the uh, Party of Free Enterprise, the Republicans. Uh, none of them suggested to, uh, that there was anything wrong with rent control. The only uh, discussion was whether they should shift the administration of the rent control law from the state capital in Albany back to the local jurisdiction, uh, jurisdiction in New York. Uh, that was the sum of the debate about rent control after you know, decades of horrendous uh, results on you know, well-documented um, uh, inferiority of the housing stock in New York of a similar age in Chicago where they don't have, um, have rent control, of course. So, uh, that was theme one of the book, just a, a remarkable disconnect between uh, the political debate and uh, issues that are just, they're just not controversy at all among economists. Um, theme two is that economists and politicians agree in principle that we should leave matters of commerce to the marketplace unless someone can demonstrate a market failure. Now, in practice, politicians devise a subsidy for some special interest group they're beholden to, then they look for a supposed market failure to justify it. And if that supposed market failure gets discredited, they go and find another one. Uh, at various times, the egregious ethanol program has been promoted as the solution to the energy shortage, the solution to the air pollution problem, and even as a way of supporting our troops in Iraq. Uh, this story has only gotten worse since the book came out, with the government pushing ethanol harder and harder in the face of rising oil prices, corn has be become more costly for the traditional use of feeding livestock and humans. So we're treated to the spectacle of interventionist congressmen who represent cattle farmers battling interventionist congressmen who represent corn growers. And the rise in food prices produced by artificially induced demand for corn has led to food riots in some countries. On top of that, recent economic ec research adds to the evidence reported in my book that the ethanol program is actually bad for the environment, not good. Shifting agricultural land to ethanol production from other uses increases the production of greenhouse gases. And that's true not only for corn-based ethanol, but also for ethanol produced from switchgrass, which is supposed to be the responsible form of an eth ethanol. On top of that, the increase in agriculture activity required for ethanol production diverts source, uh, scarce water resources, and it deposits detrimental fertilizer products that are threatening the ecology of the Mississippi River and the Gulf of Mexico. Now, theme three is uh, I uh, really believe strongly that in a democracy, people have the right to enact a bad law. 
But I also truly believe that if the proposals are presented to the voters honestly, they'll reject the ones that are economically damaging to everyone except a vested interest seeking an unfair advantage. Therefore, politicians go to great lengths to make sure the voters never get a straight story. And in Unwarranted Intrusions, I detail numerous examples of our public servants telling it like it isn't. <laughs> Perhaps the most outrageous was an attempt by the media mogul Rupert Murdoch in collusion with Hillary Clinton, among others, to tighten federal control over television audience ratings. Um, uh, the, the real reason for this unwarranted intrusion was that new and improved technology was beginning to show that the Murdoch station's audience share had been overstated under the previous methods of uh, measuring audi uh, audiences. But the politician's official story, believe it or not, was that audience measurement was a civil rights issue. <laughs> I, and you can read all about it. I, 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 I sent a copy of the book to the uh, Nielsen service, which was, of course, right in the crosshairs of this uh, alleged reform, and uh, they, uh, they, they concur that uh, uh, the story was pretty much as, 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 as outlandish and, and preposterous as it would seem. It was actually an accurate account of what happened. Now, I wish I could say that the publication of unwarranted intrusions ignited a prairie fire of honesty and economic rationality on the political landscape. Uh, well, the book has won some hearts and minds, but I'm afraid there's still a long way to go in rooting out the corruption of buying votes with the voters' own money. Uh, a much worse scam than ordinary corruption, which I would far prefer. You know, if they use their own money, uh, that would be much better, but uh, this is really uh, 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 rubbing salt in the wounds. Uh, now, in fact, the headlines tell us that our politicians are digging into a deeper hole every day. In unwarranted intrusions, I reported on research showing that home ownership subsidies uh, have produced massive overinvestment in housing in the United States. The result is a substantial penalty in national income far greater than can possibly be justified by the acknowledged community and social benefits of ownership versus rental. Um, that has been documented, but the, the cost uh, of the subsidies uh, and, and the spillover effects far, far exceeds that by any reasonable standard. And, and the benefits of pushing home ownership rates to new highs looks more and more dubious. Recent research by Carolina Katz Reed finds that for low income households, owning a home means less mobility to pursue improved employment prospects, less money to devote to children's education, and a return on investment lower than holding treasury bills. And yet, politicians persist. They're currently proposing a variety of harebrained schemes to head off foreclosures and prop up housing prices. That is, they want to A, re reward individuals who obtain free options on houses through no money down mortgages, and now are very rationally walking away because they're out of the money on their option. And B, they want to prevent home prices from reaching a level at which they would once again re represent attractive investments. The biggest outrage of all involves the GSEs, or government-sponsored enterprises, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. A few years ago, Fannie and Freddie were uh, finally getting their wings clipped. Now, this was not for the, happening for the right reason, namely that their entire mission is dubious, but because they were mired in accounting scandal. So that gave the politicians some scandal to uh, try to uh, rein them in. But once the housing crisis hit, all was forgiven, and Fannie and Freddie loomed as the saviors of the U.S. economy. Now, Fannie Mae has now been authorized to deal in mortgages of as much as $700,000, up from $420,000 previously. Now, people, step back for a minute. The median home price in the United States is $200,000. Why do we have gigantic taxpayer-subsidized companies facilitating purchases of homes with mortgages three times as large as that? Don't we presume that the buyers of those homes are not low-income families <laughs> you know, who are trying to get onto the bottom rung as the Fannie Mae propaganda uh, that is advertising <laughs> it variably suggests. You know, the question, why does Fannie Mae advertise uh, during the Super Bowl? <laughs> they do not deal with consumers. If you were running a business, why would you advertise uh, to consumers if that's not even your customer base? Clearly, to generate political sympathy and always representing, well, this is what we're doing. We're helping those you know, people get their, their, their start. Um, you know, but so surely, the people buying those $700,000 mortgage homes, even if they have no money down, are above average income families. 
And uh, so why, why, why do we have this huge middleman in there uh, taking our own taxpayers to sub tax dollars to subsidize above average income uh, uh, home buyers? Doesn't really make sense. And to add insult to injury, the cover of this week's Barron's suggests that despite all the interest rate subsidies lavished on Fannie Mae over the decades, the company has mismanaged its affairs so atrociously that it may soon require a taxpayer financed bailout. So we see the dangers of the government interfering in a basic economic activity such as providing shelter. Now let me address another sacred cow, the myth that America's savings rate is too low and something needs to be done about it. Well, the title of this section is uh, the French phrase, sauve qui peut, which is usually rendered something like every man for himself. But a loose literal translation would be let those who can save. And that would be a good policy for the government to follow in the absence of any solid evidence that all of our tax-based savings programs combined have generated one dollar of incremental savings. So we should let those who can or are willing to save because none of our expensive programs have any effect on those who can't or won't save. As I detailed in Unwarranted Intrusions, former Chairman, uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker's overall assessment of the research is that if you create a tax protected savings vehicle, people will transfer savings from a taxable to a non-taxable account, but they won't save any more than before. They may even save less because the tax preference means that they don't have to put as much away as now to reach their total retirement fund objective. And, uh, you know, it's true. The, the, the evidence is somewhat mixed on that, but you would think before launching into the, you know, the huge programs we have would kind of get a, a pretty clear cut that the evidence is sort of strongly on one side or the other, but uh, that's, that's simply not the case. Now, as for the notion that the nation's savings rate is too low, uh, the idea behind this, you know, the, the reason that we have a crisis, uh, allegedly, that has to be addressed is that uh, people aren't saving enough, and therefore there won't be enough business investment in new technologies, and productivity will decline, and the United States will become less uh, competitive as a result. Now, ever since the lobbyists for financial services firms issued the earliest of these warnings that I was able to document, U.S. productivity gains have reached a new and higher level. Uh, so it's, this is just purely a scam perpetrated by the marketers of savings products because it's clearly easier for them to get their hands on our money if it, we have specifically designated programs with all sorts of uh, uh, acronyms associated with them. You know, it's very effective for the marketing, but in terms of doing anything useful for the economy, um, you know, no, no, nothing really to support this. Now, you might ask, has this evidence caused our politicians to see the light? Uh, the answer, of course, is of course not. Uh, they persist in proposing new tax incentives for savings that are likely to be every bit as ineffective as those of the past. And you can just look at the presidential candidates' websites to see what they propose to do about the mythical savings crisis. Uh, Barack Obama, and I quote, uh, create a generous savings match for low and middle income Americans match 50% of the first $1,000 of savings for families that earn less than $75,000. Uh, the Clinton campaign, quote, Hillary's American retirement accounts. I mean, I'm not sure, what other kind would she be proposing than American? <laughs> I, I have to, you know, is she running for the you know, presidency of Mexico or something? I don't, I don't know. Uh, but she goes on to say, Offering, offer matching tax cuts of up to $500 and $1,000 to help middle class and working class, uh, working families save, end quote. So in short, instead of letting people allocate resources most efficiently without being pushed toward either saving or toward consumption uh, by the tax policy, our elected officials insist on turning savings into a political football. Um, which brings me to my next topic. Um, here is the man who has set out to save the sport of football, Arlen Specter the ranking Republican member of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Yes, um, Specter belongs to the party that purports to be the defender of free enterprise and small government. That tells you right there that our truth in advertising laws are misdirected. <laughs> now, however misguided the government's intervention in the housing market is, 
one can at least understand why politicians think it's something they ought to stick their noses into. Everyone needs housing of some kind, and for most homeowning families, their house represents their biggest financial asset. So to a politician, it sounds like there are legitimate interests to protect. But who is the victim of the New England Patriots spying on their opponent's signals with videotape cameras? <laughs> Well, I suppose that the other teams are hurt, but after all, that's why professional sports leagues have rules committees and disciplinary procedures. Now, the fans of the Patriots' opponents are unhappy, too. But is that a harm that the United States Senate should be trying to repair? People, this is entertainment. You know, wasn't it sufficient for the government to make a jackass out of itself 50-odd years ago by cleaning up television quiz shows? You know, <laughs> For, for no apparent purpose. Now, as far as I can tell, the folks who have a beef about spying on football teams are gamblers, who to some small extent got unfair odds as a result of these spy cameras. Um, wh well, why is Arlen Specter wasting our tax dollars on behalf of gamblers? Yeah. The National Football League certainly has a stake in keeping gamblers interested in their sport, even though these hypocrites would never admit it. So I say let the league clean up the game and keep the odds honest. The prime beneficiary of the Senate inquiry is Arlen Specter, <laughs> who evidently likes to see his picture in the newspaper. Uh, now, Spygate erupted after Unwarranted Intrusions was published, uh, but a sports topic that I did discuss in the book is taxpayer finance stadiums. Now, in a nutshell, no study that was financed by anyone other than a team owner, <laughs> and there have been many of those, <laughs> Uh, has ever shown an economic benefit to the municipality that subsidizes the construction of a stadium. All it does is shift consumer spending from other forms of entertainment. And for the first 90 years of professional sports, teams got along just fine in non-taxpayer supported stadiums and arenas. You know, one really uh, uh, great little vignette that I uh, came across in the course of doing the research on this, is it turns out that the um, sports owners have made Walt Disney their hero. And I said, well, well why is that? Because there was a wonderful scene where uh, Disney was uh, looking out at the uh, area in Anaheim, you know, surrounding Disneyland, and he, said, he, was, he was furious. He said, here are all these little businesses that have gotten rich off me. You know, I, I, I made all this money by building Disneyland here, and they're getting rich. That's never going to happen again. So when he went out and constructed Disney World in Orlando, he made sure that he bought up every piece of land or miles and miles surrounding that, and no one, there were, no one would get any benefit other than the Disney Corporation. And you know, this is a smart business strategy, but the team owners have emulated this. You'll notice if you go to stadiums, and they're, you know, a stadium that's 10, 15 years old, out of date, got to be replaced. What do they mean? It's got to be replaced because they need more skyboxes and they need more room inside the stadium for restaurants and entertainment, all sorts of other things, to make absolutely sure that the little bar on the corner down the road from the stadium doesn't get any revenue from this. So whatever argument that there ever was that there was a spillover effect from building a taxpayer financed stadium, you know, they've made sure to demolish. They're going to get all the revenues inside. And the reason for this is that they have to split the uh, ticket revenues with the visiting team. So the more other types of activities that they can get into the stadium, they can keep all that for themselves. The more profitable it comes, and of course, the more they need the subsidy to build this thing in the first place. And the case of the, uh, the infamous um, stadium in, in Arlington, Texas, to have the first condemnation of public property in the state of Texas ever for private use to build that stadium. Um, which uh, was a very successful venture for the uh, you know, more or less the front man for that operation, uh, George W. Bush. But, you know, that's, uh, that's, and that story is detailed in the book. Now, um, the, uh, the latest bizarre turn in the story of uh, taxpayer finance stadiums involves this gentleman here, uh, Clayton Bennett, who is the owner of the Super, uh, Seattle Supersonics uh, basketball team. Now, Bennett is currently trying to break his lease on the city's uh, basketball arena. So, uh, and the reason is, you know, he and his partners failed to get Seattle or any neighboring city to provide a new taxpayer subsidized arena. So they want to move the team to Oklahoma City. Now, 
Having failed to obtain a new subsidy in Seattle, Benefit has adopted the uh, impartial economist uh, consistent view that the team provides no economic value to the city. And that's his rationale for saying that Seattle should not mind if he walks away from the lease because they're not doing any good for the city by being there. Now, of course, in Oklahoma City, <laughs> uh, Bennett is arguing exactly the opposite, namely that having a pro basketball team will bring an economic benefit that justifies building a taxpayer-subsidized arena. Now, this issue has always been about lining team owners' pockets rather than economic reality, but it is now devolving into a theater of the absurd. Now, of course, that phrase, theater of the absurd, conjures up images other than basketball in Oklahoma City. For instance, high fashion in New York City, where I am proud to live and work. This is a catwalk photo uh, featuring a collection by Mark Jacobs. Uh, Jacobs was one of the designers whose show at the uh, Fashion Week in New York in February was produced by a company that allegedly was solicited for $40,000 in bribes, and the alleged seeker of graft was a state government employee who controlled access to the building where the, uh, the fashion shows were being held. Now, according to the charges, the superintendent of the 26th Street Armory demanded money under the table for reserving space in this highly desirable facility and for making sure, in particular, that the National Guard's deeds did not needs did not interfere with the designer's activities. Now, the uh, government official allegedly asked for $1,500 to allow a designer to begin setting up one day early without paying the daily rental fee. Now, the accused is going to get his day in court, but nowhere in the reporting of this case have I seen anyone raise the question that an economist would naturally ask, which is, why was the assignment of valuable space and setup time left at the discretion of a government employee. Here is another case, like radio airtime in Paola, where a market is bound to arise for a valuable asset, whether it's officially sanctioned or not. The rather obvious solution is to publicize the existence of these benefits and auction them off to the highest bidder. The value of the display space and the setup time would then accrue to the taxpayers and not to an enterprising state employee. So what have I learned from publishing the case against government intervention in the marketplace? Well, I've learned something that may surprise you. And by way of background, I not only live in New York, but I live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, uh, which is uh, surely one of the most liberal congressional districts in the entire United States. So you might not expect my neighbors to embrace the ideas of a book that espouses libertarian principles. But I've actually found uh, people are quite receptive to many of the book's arguments. And why shouldn't they be? I point out in the book that calcium is the nutrient in which children and the elderly in the United States are most deficient, and this is a direct result of milk price supports, which simply make dairy products too expensive. Um, I cite the World Bank estimate that on a global basis, ending agricultural trade restrictions would lift 150 million people out of poverty. And I mentioned that in the United States, tariffs, believe it or not, are higher on low-priced clothing and shoes bought by low-income people than on expensive watches and liquor bought by the wealthy. So how could any self-respecting liberal support these kind of economic inequities? Now, I have to admit that there's some strategy involved here. Um, I present these ideas in terms of economic efficiency, not in terms of ideology. And it turns out that there are many issues on which agreement is achievable across a surprisingly broad political spectrum. The late Milton Friedman ex excelled at putting such pro uh, proposals forth, including the negative income tax, which inspired the earned income credit, and also the abolition of the peacetime draft. Even if the United States has not reached a state of ideological perfection in the minds of most libertarians, I believe we're better off as a nation as a result of the free market ideas that have been put into action. And this has been accomplished by pragmatists who wanted to have to make the world better instead of waiting for it to become perfect. Now, I understand that libertarians take doctrine very seriously. You know, they say that if two libertarians ever find themselves on agreeing on something, you know that one of them has sold out. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, 
but you know, I, I'm not embarrassed to be no more of a purist than Milton Friedman. And I, I know that the libertarian movement has many sincere individuals who argue that the issue is not economic efficiency at all, but freedom. And you know, I sometimes think that maybe this movement, if, if it's possible to describe such a, a, a group as a movement, uh, you know, maybe it's really two completely separate strains. I think there are people who are very interested in economic efficiency, and it turns out that uh, freedom is uh, very consistent. You wind up with the same results when you proceed from these uh, two different directions, and one can imagine a universe where it wouldn't be uh, the case, where you'd wind up with inefficiency as a result of freedom or lack of freedom as a result of economic efficiency. Um, but uh, but I, I know that for many people, that really is the issue more so than the types of uh, 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 questions I've been talking about, the economic fallacies that arise from interfering in people's ability to uh, uh, enter uh, uh, freely into transactions with other consulting ad adults. But um, <clears throat> the problem is that while there's a reasonably objective consensus on what constitutes economic efficiency, the same cannot be said for economic freedom. This word freedom has a different meaning for the gun-owning, cigarette-smoking, and helmetless motorcycle-riding members of this audience uh, <laughs> than it does for many of my friends on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And this difference in understanding uh, has been a fact of life for, for centuries. At the time of the American Revolution, uh, the British writer Samuel Johnson observed that the loudest yelps about liberty came from the drivers of slaves. Now, this is material for a wonderful and necessary philosophical debate. But my experience has been that a great deal can be accomplished to improve the lot of mankind before these debates get resolved many eons from now. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk one debt of gratitude to the Mises Institute and let me conclude my formal remarks uh, by mentioning a second. I am very grateful for the opportunity to share ideas with such a distinguished audience, and I look forward to hearing the views of those of you who have been so kind to listen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Yeah, no, I, I'd be glad to. And yes. Uh, I am a new member of the John Birch Society, which some of you may have heard about. And then I'm not clear on where we come from. It's a learning experience. <laughs> but they seem to be as paranoid about corporations and how are they, they are government wise. And when you hear that Caterpillar is one of the prime lobbyists at uh, a foreign aid hearing, one can only conclude that we get the Finest government money can buy in this country. And therefore, uh, I would promote uh, uh, liberty rather than uh, power. How we can achieve that here, you and I and the others all over the world. Yeah, well, I. I uh, yeah. should be right in bed. And you and I and, and the, uh, the average citizen have very little power. Yes, yeah, so, well, the, uh, the question uh, had to do with uh, corporates being equ uh, corporations being equally uh, 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 culpable in uh, the um, market distortions, and, and I, I, it's, it's certainly true, and this, it's um, uh, an idea that I think if you look into economic history, you'll find a great deal of support for that. I think even some of the books here and in the library uh, deal with the uh, origins of some of the New Deal programs, and, and a uh, previous book that I did, uh, uh, that I wrote, um, dealt with that period in part, it was really looking at stock market performance, but did focus on, as it happens, I don't know how many people are aware, but 1933 was the best market uh, year of the 20th century, um, oddly enough, right after the, the bottom of the, uh, the, the Depression. But um, when you look at the sort of the first New Deal, the um, highlighted by the National Industrial Recovery Act, uh, the ideas of uh, sort of forming cartels, um, and really going very far away from any sort of uh, market-based principles were ideas that had been in the air for a number of years before that with some of the leading uh, figures of the industrial world being very supportive. So the, the idea has been portrayed that this has been a uh, consistent battle between business and government working at odds against other. I think that the corporations uh, 
to the extent that they find government interfering with things they do, yes, would like to have their cake and eat it too. They would like very much to be involved, to have government very involved in uh, fighting their battles for them, uh, limiting markets, closing markets off to their competitors, uh, enforcing standards that um, in many cases are uh, seem, uh, well, I think there's evidence to support it, but just on the face would appear to be aimed at raising the barrier for smaller competitors simply because it's large, easier for a larger corporation to comply uh, with, with those standards. So, it, so it, I, I'm, I'm completely in agreement with you, and, and I, many of the chapters uh, in Unwarranted Intrusions uh, pointed to corporate interests as really being the inspiration behind those subsidies that, um, again, were presented as great public benefits. Of course, you know, po 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 uh, politically, you can't go out and saying, we want to put this in for the benefit of you know, uh, some Fortune 500 company, but you can present in terms of this will create jobs, uh, this will uh, bring prosperity. I have a long uh, a chapter in there about the whole idea of corporate uh, location incentives, which is just a massive blackmail scheme, you know, playing one municipality off against another. Clearly, there's no gain for the country as a whole. Fortunately, there is uh, one economics professor uh, uh, pursuing the idea has not been successful so far, but intends to uh, continue to get this outlawed and claims under the Commerce Clause, this, it should be illegal for, uh, for municipalities to offer incentives for companies to relocate. I think it would be a great thing if it happens. I'm not a constitutional lawyer. But I don't know how it will ultimately come out. The last case was sort of thrown out on a technicality, but I think it will come around again. Yeah. Uh, the UAW oh. and their friends are also very busy on sure sending uh, kind of contribution. Oh. Oh. Okay, wait, we can come back, sure. If, uh, if, uh, yes. yes, sir. Money that the government is not putting into the housing market. Would it be a better investment to buy a house now than to hold it? <laughs> 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 no, it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Better than before or better than later? Than okay. later. Would it be a better investment? Let's say you're young. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm moving out west sometime. The answer is five twenty-five. What you can afford. Yeah. Or, or would you? I mean, when I you're looking at the housing market now, how would how would you as an investment guy? Who would you invest in more? Yeah, stock market doesn't look so good right at the moment either, Frank. Right? <coughs> yeah. Yeah. I, you know, no, I would say uh, that you know it's always always risky to try to be a market timer. It it would appear to me that we have further to go in the housing crisis. I, I think it's early to proclaim a bottom, and you know, so in ter just in terms of getting in at a good price, uh, probably will be a better opportunity. I, I wouldn't get too cute about it because uh, you know I have been a homeowner. Uh, for um, a little over 25 years now, and um, that you always have some nervousness. Are you getting in at the right moment? We, uh, prices are at a high, and in, in my market in New York City, um, you know, I, I, when I was working at uh, at uh, Salman Brothers, there was a very bright um, economist there, and he came up with a good formula about the value of houses having to do with you know, uh, one quarter of people's income and you know, a ratio of their income to the mortgage payments and so on. And I did that calculation and realized that uh, cooperative apartments were selling for well over two times that uh, level. And I said, well, this uh, must, be, uh, must be a bad idea. But I, I you know, fortunately did go ahead and buy, and it's, it's worked out very well. So over, um, over, uh, over time, you know, housing does tend to work out. Doesn't, it's not the, as great an investment as people believe when you really look closely at inflation-adjusted numbers. Uh, the Case-Shiller Index uh, created by uh, Robert Schiller at Yale is, I think, doing a lot of good in showing the, the fallacy in the uh, price rise of houses is they look at new houses, which are um, du double the size on average of what they were a generation earlier. So if you bring the new house in, of course, the house value goes go up because you're talking about bigger houses. If you look at the same houses, and he's done that in Amsterdam over a 400-year period, and shown that housing values have gone up with inflation, but you, you haven't gotten rich. But with the tax subsidization, that makes it more attractive. And I would say that while I'm totally opposed to those 
subsidies. Uh, they're unnecessary. They have the same home ownership rates in Canada and Australia as they do in the United States without any uh, mortgage deductibility. Uh, I wouldn't go so far. If I were your if financial advisor, I think it would be irresponsible for me to say, well, on principle, don't take advantage of that while it exists. And, uh, you know, as long as it does, uh, it'll probably make, uh, make it attractive. So I would say I wouldn't rush into it right now because I think we're still seeing the aftermath of uh, getting to the point where, uh, in, I believe in Naples, Florida, we got to the point where 25% of new, newly constructed houses were owned by speculators. I mean, that, that was a statistic that just boggled my mind that anyone could seriously believe that that was somehow economically justified, but that was the, the extent we got. So we have a lot to work out and some inventory to work off. But it's a longer-term proposition. Again, I, I don't think you have to get at the absolute bottom for it to uh, ultimately work out very well for you. Yes? <laughs> so I think we have an inside joke. By the way, I'm very proud that my book winds up right next to Milton Friedman's on the bookshelf. Uh, so I, I feel I'm getting some benefit that he ought to really be, uh, his estate ought to be profiting from because people will find my book looking for him. But, uh, <laughs> okay. Well, I, I I think you stated it very well. He also uh, favored um, uh, right to have um, closed shops in unions. Um, is that if 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 a state wanted to have that, if a union wanted, they, they had a right to organize, and if they wanted to have a shop that you know, did not have right to work laws. Um, <clears throat> I think that um, uh, if you go through the whole spectrum of uh, people have been identified with uh, you know, libertarian free market ideas, you're going to find inconsisten inconsistencies as you, know, as you would view them. Like that, I think that um, he, uh, overall, um, I think he's had a tremendous intellectual influence on people, the uh, television programs, the column he wrote for uh, Newsweek and so on, and I think really has opened up a lot of people's ideas, and you know, there's no uh, requirement to go down the line, uh, you know, uh, on, the, on the ideas that he uh, uh, supported, but I think that, you know, when, he, when uh, Capitalism and Freedom came out in uh, 1962, it was uh, viewed very, a very radical book, was not reviewed by any major uh, publication because it was so far outside the orthodoxy, and he talked about um, uh, returning uh, public parks, uh, national parks, to private ownership. Um, uh, the the idea of the um, educational vouchers, I, and there probably is a there are probably as many opinions on that in this room as there are people or more opinions uh, on that. But uh, I think it, at least opening up the idea, and, and this was the cause, as you may know, toward the end of his life, he was mostly focused on was the idea of some form of choice. In, in schooling, and that that would be very hard for me. I, so I would say, if if you listen, even a, you know a, a longer litany, I would say for that idea alone, I, I would. I, my father actually, I learned uh, he died many years ago, but I learned from my mother that uh, several years before uh, Friedman came up with the idea of vouchers, you know, my own father was very uh, supporting the idea of privatizing all of the schools. I don't think he had exactly the mechanism. Uh, and um, so I sort of grew up hearing some of that, and when I read in college, believe it or not, at Harvard, many people are surprised to hear that we, I would have read Milton Friedman as an undergraduate at Harvard, but I did, I was assigned it, and uh, uh, I was tremendously impressed by some of those ideas. So I think that at least if it got people thinking uh, along some of the ideas that maybe the orthodoxy about the, the supposed need for government intervention, intervention in some of these areas, um, uh, was was obviously correct. Um, then I would say I, I think he 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 accomplished a lot and, and got people thinking more. And if others uh, have carried it further, I think that's that's all to the better. But but I, I very much appreciate the comment. Yes.
poor person buys clothes or, or shoes that they pay high taxes, and then a rich person pays uh, buys clothes or liquor, they pay low taxes. Aren't you afraid that that strategy might backfire? <laughs> they just say, oh, well, you need to raise the taxes on the, on the rich. Uh, well, I would, yeah, I mean, I would get rid of the tariffs altogether, because this is what really what we're talking, you know, these, these are tariffs specifically, and it's just a sort of a strange accident that it's worked out that way. I don't think anyone set out to say, well, let's have a regressive form of taxation uh, on tariffs, but it's, it's very costly. You know, I think the number was about $500 a year that uh, a single parent family winds up uh, spending extra on basic goods, apparel and, and shoes as a result of this. So, um, yeah, I would say, no, the, the, certainly if you talk about these issues, you know, the same people will turn around and in many cases and say, oh, well, yes, let's have excise taxes um, and, uh, you know, let's uh, uh, um, increase the pro prog progressiveness of the tax system. And, you know, those are all uh, debates. I, I think it's just, uh, um, it is interesting that um, many of the ideas, when you get past the ideology and get past putting labels on them, I think they're ideas that could be implemented. I mean, I, just as an example, and I talked about in the book that, um, I really believed that uh, after 2004, when President Bush had uh, very strong political support and committed himself to making Social Security reform the main domestic uh, initiative, there really was an opportunity. I think that tactically, uh, he went about it all wrong. And I say that with some authority, having moderated a program by Jose Pinheiro, who um, was the economist who uh, brought about the change in the uh, Chilean uh, social security system and did it right and he did it he explained that he did it in steps there were questions from the audience saying well you didn't do this you didn't do that he said no we did do those things we just didn't do it in the first round because we had to get a political acceptance and I and I really believe that if you had gone to the public and said we have to get off the pay-as-you-go system for you know we may want to get private accounts we might want to do that like there are other things but the first thing you have to do is to get out of this uh, endless cycle where you're chasing your tail and saying, well, we're paying for the previous generation. This, to me, is the greatest unfairness, one of the greatest un, uh, inequities in our, our system today, that my children's quality of life will be determined by the size of the generation they're in. There's no need for that. This idea that Social Security broke down, it was a great system that broke down because people are living longer. See, this is, this is the welfare state patting itself on the back. See, we did such a great job, people are living longer. That's nonsense. You know, the, 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 the extension of, of, of uh, life expectancy after people enter the, wor the workforce, which is all that matters, is, uh, you know, two or three years for males, a little bit longer for women. That's not why the system broke down, but that's the myth that's been perpetrated. If you'd gone out with the facts and said, let's get the most important change, you will need a couple of trillion dollars to fund the existing liability, but let's take that step. Let's really get it on to the right uh, system. I, so, so I think that could have been achieved, and I think that uh, could have been done with very broad political support just because it made good sense. And, and I really do believe, and I, I mean very sincerely when I say that if, if these ideas were ever presented honestly to the American people, I think they have a lot more sense. Uh, I think my biggest objection to some of my neighbors is a presumption that everyone outside of their neighborhood, and particularly when you get west of the Hudson River, uh, <laughs> you know, never reads a newspaper, has no idea what's going on. I, I, you know, if they went out and talked to people, I worked in college as a door-to-door uh, -door salesman and you know, dealt with families uh, at all levels of the economic spectrum, and I was uh, impressed again and again with a good sense. I mean, and I talked about schools. You know, I found that parents who had maybe not even graduated from high school themselves knew all about the schools. They knew who the good teachers were and which ones they wanted to get, and, and they were unhappy with the way their schools were being run, and they were doing something about it. And so this elitist attitude that, you know, you, you couldn't make positive change in the system because people just wouldn't understand it, I, just not at all borne out by my experience, but you do have to have an honest presentation uh, because I think people, you know, they're, they're very busy. They can't be on top of every issue, so if you're confusing them, you know, they, they, uh, it's not surprising they wouldn't get a, a clear idea. So I'm sorry to r be uh, r all around the barn on your uh, question, but it raises a, a number of uh, issues I, I think are very important. Yes, sir. 
Well, yeah, the question uh, is the uh, pendulum likely to swing back looking at it from a historical perspective. And I have um, uh, definitely made use of my uh, uh, history undergraduate major in the, uh, uh, the writing I've done on uh, economic topics and, of course, in this uh, in political economy and, and finance. Um, uh, I really thought the pendulum was swinging right up until September 11, 2001. Uh, I thought you were uh, seeing a much more... Uh, you know, uh, more acceptance, um, even among you know constituencies that would historically been viewed as uh, liberal market interventionists. I think more and more you heard politicians saying, "Well, let's see what the market can do. Can we engage the private sector?" That was becoming respectable, and uh, I, I think it just turned on a dime. On, and you know, for understandable reasons. Uh, that I mean, at least it's, it's it, it, understandable in the sense that it's a reaction that you would have predicted based on past experience. Uh, I'm sure there's lot, been lots of discussion even this weekend about many of the civil liberties issues uh, that have been raised by September 11th, but I think that unfortunately that spilled over um, it, into the economic sphere as well. I think it will come back. I think that all of these you know, crises that we look at do pass in time and we look back and we can almost, uh, can almost not understand. I remember at the time I was in college um, reading a book about advertising that was going at great lengths to, um, you know, defend the idea that you know uh, that advertising was okay, and I, I didn't really understand that, you know, t 20 years earlier there had been a very um, uh, severe criticism of uh, the, the supposed brainwashing going on by advertising, and you know how terrible it was, and you had, you know, so we can almost not understand the context in which the criticism. So I think we'll look back at this period and some of the laws and uh, policies that are in place and really not be able to understand very well what was driving it all. But it, it, certainly fear uh, has been a big part of it. So I think, yes, it will come back. I think that um, over time, uh, again, partly because of the efi efficiency issues, I think pe people's yearning for freedom also is a very big part of it. But when you start looking at the costs of the programs that are out there, uh, and uh, you know, it, it inevitably it, it must start. And I, I was very encouraged by the... Um, the Mennonite Church uh, beginning to take a stand on uh, agricultural subsidies. You know, many of their members are farmers, but they're saying, as a matter of conscience, we really have to start looking at this, that we're destroying agriculture in all these countries where we're dumping American agricultural goods to support the American farmer, and this is a serious moral issue. So in that, I think you're starting to see more broadly among uh, evangelical churches uh, you know, that are concerned about other issues as well, but saying, yeah, these are things we ought to be concerned about as well. So I think that if the ideas make good sense, they start to filter in you know, throughout societies and start to show up in places where uh, where you might be surprised to find them. So I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll swing back. So. <laughs> yeah, I uh, yeah I don't I don't have a lot of uh, contact with uh, Warren Buffett, uh, though uh, <coughs> I hear his name invoked almost every day because uh, most people say claim to be Warren Buffett style investors. It's right, there doesn't seem to be anything else out there. Um, <coughs> but uh, but you know it's not surprising he's done quite well, of course. So uh, you know, not surprising that people would look to emulate him. But um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. The, 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 um, uh, there, there are, again, surprising results, some of which uh, I think is ultimately uh, looking for political favor. So if, um, you know, if you support certain policies, um, that, that the party that you think is going to be in power will sooner or later be, you know, we have a two-party system, so you know, sooner or later, you know, one, one party that's out now will be in, and uh, there may be some benefit in that. And, you know, and I, I think, I, I don't, I don't, you know, doubt though there are many sincere people who disagree with me. I mean, uh, and uh, uh, so you know, they, they just have a different view about uh, tax policy. And so I think clearly, um, uh, I, I would I presume most of the people in this room uh, would believe that uh, more enlightened economic policies would do more to benefit uh, and, and promote the the, uh, the well-being of uh, people in our society. But um, 
And we, you know, it's, it, it's, I, I, that's why I think it's, it's worthwhile going out and telling the story, uh, presenting ideas, and you know, it's, it's very good to uh, also have another strain out there that's presenting in a very rigorous uh, ideological way um, some of these ideas. But I, I think if you can appeal and get an understanding of uh, those who aren't starting with pretty much the same view as yourself, uh, there's some good to be achieved there as well. So, and yes. What do you see as most troubling and or, on the other side of the point, most encouraging? Okay, yeah, the most uh, troubling and most encouraging I aspects of the, yeah, of the current economic uh, 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 situation. <clears throat> I would say probably the most discouraging is the policy response so far because I think we're really running a risk of getting into a Japan-like torpor for a number of years by continuing to paper over the problems. Um, you know, it's painful. I, I, one of the most remarkable comments I saw was, well, yes, I, we understand the issue of moral hazard, and this is very important, but we're past that now. I said, so, no, it's right when it matters. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's when you just abandon the idea of holding people responsible, and, you know, and you throw more gasoline on the flames. And, uh, you know, so, so that's very troubling. Um, the continued uh, notion that somehow lowering interest rates further is going to solve the problem of people being very uncomfortable uh, holding uh, any kind of credit risk right now, which is the real issue, but the continued pressure from Wall Street. Um, and, you know, these are you know, not, you know, left-wing uh, type people for the most part, but the idea, well, if we just somehow if we keep lowering interest rates, which I think clearly, you know, is it coincidental that gold and oil are hitting these uh, record highs? I, hard for me to believe uh, that the loss of faith in the dollar is not really you know, a critical element to that, you know, partly because of that continuing to, uh, to lower rates um, uh, in, in this way. So that, I think, is probably the most discouraging aspect of it. Um, the most encouraging is that uh, we seem to not be able to kill it. I mean, no matter how bad the policies will be, eventually... Uh, prices do fall, uh, and, and speculators are certainly still out there. I know in my little corner of the market, which is uh, the lower quality corporate debt, and the booming part right now is the distressed debt, uh, even at a, a, a somewhat lower tier, there's a lot of money uh, ready to invest, and, uh, and, the, and the people who, who have that money are very comfortable uh, looking at credits, even though the headlines will read bad and so on, there are level you can get to a value that you can be very comfortable with. Ultimately, they're not rushing in. Uh, one, I don't do a lot of predicting. Uh, you know, I, we, we don't really uh, try to predict the future. And for practical reason, in New York City, there's actually a law against it. Um, <laughs> uh, and this is true. Um, it was originally aimed at fortune tellers, but as um, <laughs> There was a, a, a circuit court ruling in 1931 that made it illegal to predict the future for pay in any form. And when Mayor Bloomberg finally begins to enforce this law, a lot of people are going to be in serious trouble. So, so we kind of, we're kind of, but one, one thing, one prediction I did make was that I thought in this cycle we would uh, hear a revival of the um, metaphor, don't try to catch a falling knife. And uh, that, that came back very swiftly, and the idea that people, are, I think, are going to buy these assets uh, when they start to feel that they really are reaching a bottom. It's a little early yet, but I think we will see the market uh, forces start to kick in again. Right now, it, it looks pretty bleak, but I, I have pretty good confidence that that will kick in eventually. So there's some reason to be, uh, be hopeful. But let's hear, uh, take, may I take one more? And, one more. Uh, okay, great. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's right. Well, since I, I'm in Auburn, I think I can make a prediction unless you have an ordinance I don't know about. Uh, so I'll, I'll run the risk. But, uh, but thank you very much for the chance.